welcome today to this uh, local development forum webinar on integrated local service delivery. How do we get there? Um, we're pleased to have you join us today. This is part of our local development forum, uh, and we have a, a number of in-person and, uh, and online events uh, that help share international good practices and social innovations and also an opportunity to share different resources, um, including from the OECD. Uh, today, we really have a focus on local service integration. Uh, it builds also on some of our discussions we had last uh, December in a webinar on, on human-centered design, and you'll be able to find that recording online if you're interested in hearing about human-centered design, in particular in employment-related uh, services. Um, my name is Karen McGuire, and I'm helping to uh, lead up this um, program of the Local Employment and Economic Development Committee here at the OECD that was created 40 years ago to help share uh, share practices, and our Local Development Forum is the one of the vehicles uh, that we use to do that. So today we have um, two new OECD reports that we're releasing, and we have a, a very uh, interesting panel discussion. So we have a couple of papers that are looking at um, who does what across levels of government in terms of employment services, and then another paper on service integration with a focus on employment policies and other kinds of uh, wraparound services. So maybe we can go to the slide just to let you know that um, the sort of uh, run of show here. So we're going to have, uh, first we'll have a, um, a presentation by uh, Tilda Using of the of the OECD, um, who's going to just share a little bit of the highlights from, from these papers. And then we're going to run into um, a panel discussion where we'll be able to hear from our different speakers who I will introduce in a moment. But you can see here on the screen, every place from the United, the European Commission to uh, the European Social Network to um, Manchester, Brussels, Lyon, and uh, and then folks around the world. So for those that are participating, don't hesitate to say where you're dialing in from in the chat function. So feel free to uh, to say uh, who you are and where you're coming in from. Uh, and then um, as we have our different speakers, don't hesitate to use the uh, question uh, function if you have questions for the for the different speakers because there'll be an opportunity for them to answer as well as um, a broader panel discussion. Um, so I think you know we're gonna talk a little bit about why if local service integration is such a great idea? Why is it so hard to do it? And what are the different sort of uh, solutions people have found uh, to make it happen? And so why don't we um, why don't we kick off the the discussion then with um, some slides from uh, Tilda that are just going to set the framework, and then we'll jump and in, dump into the panel discussion. So Tilda, over to you. Yes, thank you so much, Karen, and, and welcome to everyone who's joining. So my name is Tilde, and I'm a policy analyst at the OECD Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities. And as Karen just said, and maybe we can already go to the next slide, we're launching two new papers today, one on the role of local authorities in active labor market policies and the other in their role in supporting service integration for individuals in vulnerable situations. And before we go into the panel discussion, I am just gonna say a few words about the main elements in this second paper on local service integration. So if we go to the next slide first, I just wanted to put this topic of service integration a bit into the wider context of the current labor market situation. So, we currently see across OECD countries that labor markets are experiencing increasing labor and skill shortages across many different sectors. And on the demand side, this comes to show, among others, in elevated job vacancy rates. And on the supply side, we see that the number of job seekers are going down in many countries and also a fall in unemployment levels. Uh, here we see the average uh, levels across the OECD, but this really comes to show in many countries. So from a labor market perspective, the need for integration of those who are furthest from the labor market into the, into the world of work is indeed increasing. But at the same time, we also see that inactivity rates remain at a relatively high uh, and relatively stable level. Uh, and also that the number of needs, so youth not in employment, education or training, is, is slightly increasing across countries. So this is somewhat of a paradox, and I, I think it shows that governments indeed are struggling uh, to identify the right measures to support labor market inclusion of those 
who are really furthest away from the labor market. Uh, and if we move to, to the next slide then, because in this context, we see that, uh, that governments are asking the question if, if service integration can be a part of the solution, be the way forward. Uh, and just so we have the terms right by service integration, we mean a situation where multiple types of services, social, employment, education, and so on, across multiple government levels and providers are uh, delivered in a more joined up way with the aim to provide more coherent and holistic support for individuals with multiple needs. And so as shown in this figure here, it often has both a horizontal integration across service areas and a virtual uh, integration dimension uh, uh, across levels of, of government. And I think service integration comes at a time where traditional welfare systems do face some challenges in terms of providing support for those with, uh, with multiple needs. So traditional systems tend to be organized in silos, operating according to their own legislation, their own cult cultures, and so on. And this just doesn't really work for those who need support from many different parts of, of, of the public system. And here, service integration can potentially offer a way for, for governments both to provide more effective support for individuals who need it, but also to be more efficient, efficient in, in public spending by reducing bureaucracy, overlap in services, and, and ultimately just improving the results for, for clients and, and moving them from the benefit system into the world of work. And so if we move to the next slide, because with this new paper, uh, we're zooming in on the role of local authorities in service integration and the many different roles they can play, but also, as Karen said, the challenges and the solutions that they, that they face and find uh, when it comes to service integration. And this, of course, begs the question, so why is the local dimension even important in service integration? I think there are uh, many different answers to this. So uh, first of all, there is the, the question about governance structures. So in many OCD countries, there is extensive decentralization of uh, responsibilities for welfare services to lower levels of government. And the new OECD paper on multi-level governance of active labor market policies show that in two out of five countries, subnational governments and local governments have formal competencies in this area. And in addition, they tend to have competences in many other related areas, social, health, education, and so on. And closely re related to, uh, to this, there is the question about financing. So with responsibilities also often comes uh, a financing element. And this means in many uh, countries, the financial burden uh, to pay for those who are out of work and need support tend to fall on local authorities. And this can both mean that they can realize potential budget savings by improving the service delivery, uh, reducing spending on social services, but this again also needs uh, to be supported by the right financial incentives and structures to ensure that when they in invest in service integration that the benefits also fall on them. Then a third uh, argument is that local authorities tend to be uh, very close to citizens uh, and the local stakeholder system that is so extremely important when it comes to support for, for the most vulnerable groups. Uh, and then a fourth key argument, I think, is that the engagement of local authorities allow for piloting or testing uh, of different new ideas in, in, in the sphere of service integration at a manageable scale. And this leads to the figure that you see here with the different examples that we also highlight in the paper of how local uh, authorities can engage in service integrating, ranging for just uh, the mere implementation of national reforms locally to piloting of new models or ideas over to examples where service integration ambitions actually drive decentralization reform, pushing responsibilities downwards to local level. And then examples where local authorities go on their own, develop new service integration models within the existing uh, national structure. And then if we move to the next slide, 
Um, just to give a few for more insights on the financial uh, dimension. So the first uh, figure shows the allocation of local government spending across different areas. And, and we see here uh, that they do tend to have an important role both in education and, and, and the social area. This is for selected OECD countries. And then I think another uh, interesting example is uh, is, the, is here on the right that we see from Denmark, a, a study that a, a consulting group, income and consulting group have done uh, on the spending uh, in local uh, authorities and those who have multiple needs. So what they have found is that the 1% of the clients supported by local governments take up around 30% of local government's budgets. So this is really a rather small group with intense uh, support needs that really uh, take up a big part of the budget. So it just uh, supports the argument that there could be an interest and a role for local authorities in, in improving the service delivery for this group. If we go to the next uh, slide, I think uh, this was the argument why uh, service integration could be an interesting way to go, also interesting for local authorities. But at the same time, we also see that there are multiple challenges uh, or barriers that to some extent may explain why there is still a uh, hesitancy uh, across countries and across local areas to push forward on service integration reforms. Uh, these are the different uh, challenges that we highlight in the paper and I won't go through all of them now that will take too, too much time, but I just wanted to highlight two that I think are uh, very important uh, and, and where I think we, we need more knowledge also. So first, uh, I think a central barrier is, is on data uh, and IT systems and, and the question about data sharing. So data systems do really play an increasing role in today's public service delivery, but often data systems are developed to specific organization or to, to specific service areas and it's difficult to integrate them. Uh, and, and that really impedes the, the quality of service delivery that the professionals or caseworkers can give simply because they need the information from different parts of the system to give the best possible support. Uh, but it's also very expensive and time consuming to develop new systems, data systems. So, so this can, can impede local governments to, to, to go in this direction. Another point I wanted to highlight is the question about professional cultures and differences. So when we integrate, it's about cooperation between different caseworkers coming from different service areas with different cultural backgrounds, uh, educations, and so on. And they need to work together and they need to trust each other. And this is really not so uh, straightforward as it could sound. Uh, so, so this, I think, is another challenge to be, to be aware of. And if we then go to the, the next and last slide, to the most interesting part, which is then, but how can we overcome these challenges uh, for local authorities? And the more broader question, how can we achieve effective forms of service integration? And overall uh, evaluations and, and knowledge in this field is, is still limited. We need more evaluations and we need to have more knowledge of on what works and what doesn't. But nevertheless, I think there are still uh, some key findings from, from existing research that, that we can highlight. So first on the challenges and how to overcome them. Uh, some important em elements seems to be, uh, first of all, strong stakeholder commitment and mutual trust at all levels and throughout the process. Uh, then a strong governance structure that is agreed with uh, and binding for all stakeholders involved in the process sufficient funding, not least upfront, to support the, the first investments in, in new models or programs, and then some models to pool financing across different organizations or authorities. And then lastly, leading back to the, the point on professional cultures that need to be a coherent skills development systems that go with the integration process, for example, joint, joint training of different uh, types of caseworkers. Then on the elements of effective service integration, I think what we see based on all the different models that are already out there, some of the, the things that seems to work are first of all, multidisciplinary teams uh, and one coordinating case manager, 
uh, also an individual action plan, so not multiple action plans in multiple systems, but one single action plan that cut across different service areas. Then very important is also a human-centered design approach. As Karen said, we recently had another webinar on this, and I think it's very, very important when it comes to service integration, integration that, that the new models we build are based on involvement of, of clients in the decision-making. And then lastly, leading back to the point on data sharing, comprehensive information sharing systems for case workers uh, is very important and seems to be key to, to effective service integration models. That being said, there are still a lot of unknowns in terms of what works, what doesn't, what can support the process of integration uh, and so on. But I think this is, this is at least some important findings we have for now and which are also highlighted in the paper. So with that, I, I will leave the floor, give it back to Karen so we can get to the panel discussion. Great, thank you uh, so much, Tilda. And I know that there's a lot of uh, hot issues on you know, who pays, who benefits when you do service integration. How do we get over a lot of these data sharing considerations? How do we get across the different cultures from the different uh, systems that we have, different levels of government, all sorts of fun uh, challenges that I think our panelists are all working to help uh, overcome in their different areas. So um, so I'd like to uh, start, uh, start the panel discussion um, and uh, maybe first up at bat, as we say where I'm from, uh, will be Alfonso Lara Montero, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the European Social Network. Um, and um, Alfonso, uh, Alfonso, you've been uh, working in this field for, for quite a while. You're working with regional and local authorities, thinking about issues of service integration. And you, you know, from the ESN's perspective, where you're seeing lots of different regions and, and localities really looking at how to do uh, service integration well, what are some of your thoughts on this topic? Many thanks, Karen and Tilde and the OECD for your invitation to uh, participate in uh, this webinar and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, as you were saying, the European Social Network uh, or ESN is a network for public uh, social services in Europe at all levels of government, whether national, regional or local. And uh, in the area of social services, which is our focus over the past years, we've also received a number of requests from other uh, types of organizations to join ESN working in areas related to workforce regulation or direct service provision. So we've enlarged the membership also to have them uh, join as associates. And I thought it was important to uh, highlight this at the start because we've done this to recognize that the social services landscape is uh, particularly complex. And we currently have 176 uh, member organizations in 35 uh, countries. For different reasons, there has been over the past years a transfer of public uh, responsibility, responsibility, if I might say, towards the non-public sector in the area of social services. There are a number of reasons for this. Uh, whether it's new public management models, uh, ideas spread also around Europe uh, that the non-public sector might be more agile or better placed in certain cases to address uh, certain social needs. Uh, the application of uh, EU procurement rules and neo co-production models or an understanding of agencies providing services, not just as contractors, but as actual partners. Because of these reasons and others, uh, we can certainly say that the, uh, the social services systems are quite complex and there are a number of interrelations which are increasingly being developed. On the one hand, between the authorities uh, responsible for social services planning, financing and management, and the agencies responsible for delivery and provision, and on the other, between public authorities uh, responsible for a wide spectrum of social services, including also primary community health care, employment, education, or housing, just to name some. This is the case because we are also seeing increased divergence in the way social services are being defined. The classical definition related to a specific responsibilities linked to social work is now being broadened to focus rather on the objective, that's to say on promoting autonomy and uh, promoting uh, social inclusion. So within this context, we are seeing increased uh, forms of cooperation leading to coordination. And in some cases, very few, integration of social services with other services. 
Um, these examples may take uh, various forms. I'm just going to mention three because we don't have much time. In terms of, uh, in terms of some, some of these examples, so we can start with cooperation protocols, um, which we can find in all social services related areas, just to mention one of them. For instance, in the area of child social welfare or child protection, which is usually a responsibility at a local level, which can be implemented through conference calls, which are organized by uh, social services and local authorities, which also sit across the table with other services like health, schools, and the police. You mentioned this earlier on in the previous presentation by TIL, the integrated teams of professionals bringing together practitioners from different sectors. Uh, examples coming from across all social services might include, for instance, integrated child protection teams, social workers, psychologists, uh, social educators, health professionals. In some cases, these teams may be mobile, in others might be integrated within the local authority. Another example would be mental health teams of uh, social workers, psychologists, primary health care professionals, and uh, community nurses. These teams may sit within social or health services. Uh, indeed, in the past, uh, local authorities used to have them, but over the years, we've also seen in a number of countries due to austerity constraints that they've been transferring uh, more to the health sector, which is uh, not necessarily the right approach, particularly as they, they may have a more medical than a um, social focus. It is also important to mention that some of these things also integrate people with experience of care. And the third model within these integrated teams would be uh, examples of social services and employment teams where a social worker and an employment advisor work together to support the employment and social inclusion of people farthest from the labor market, including both a joint assessment of needs, but also uh, the creation of a joint plan with the person. And the third form of cooperation I'd like to mention is the development of new integrated agencies, which again may have different forms. Let's say the simplest one would be co-locating professionals from other sectors, for example, social workers or uh, social educators in employment offices, so that they can provide um, um, a joint plan uh, for people searching for a job uh, who are farthest from the labor market. Uh, and uh, integrated health and social care agencies, which have been implemented in some regions in Europe and have a joint or a, a one portfolio of services coming from both sectors, as well as one management team and one budget. These agencies might sit within or work with local authorities, and they also imply a transfer of responsibilities, both from the local authorities' uh, social services and from the national or regional uh, health service. So uh, all in all, in conclusion, uh, we can see across Europe, and for a number of different reasons, a wide variety of ways in which local authorities are promoting cooperation across their uh, social services and also with other services uh, and in other levels of governments to respond to these uh, social trends, which I mentioned at the beginning, and also the diverse needs uh, of the populations that they support. Thank you. Great, right. thanks so much, uh, Alfonso, for going over some of the different models that have been uh that have been set up. Um, just out of curiosity, is there any any one that you wanted to flag that uh, you've seen? Maybe they've tried it in one place and it's scaled up a little bit within their country. Because I think one of the things that everyone's really trying to understand is when you do an experiment, how do you then uh, get it to to scale up? So I don't know if any come to mind. Yes, there are some examples actually. Since uh, uh, Jeroen is here and we've got colleagues from the European Commission, I wanted to mention a couple of them which have received funding from France from the EU. So, uh, and actually, they come from a couple of our members. So, two different ones. On the one hand, you've got um, uh, social history. So, the idea is to bring together the data from uh, people who are being supported by uh, social services. 
There was one example in a region in Spain that was supported by the Social Innovation Fund by the EU to uh, start piloting in a couple of places in the region, but also in, an, in, a number of, uh, in a number of municipalities. And after this, this has been integrated into, the, into policy and legislation as part of the wider social services law and actually has continued to have uh, funding. That's one example. Another example is <clears throat> A couple of uh, professionals coming from uh, social services or social workers in the local authority and employment advisors, the creation of uh, teams uh, joining them up with a methodology to assess uh, the situation of the person uh, and then follow up and uh, evaluation. Uh, and this was again implemented also in a European region with uh, uh, innovation funds uh, from the EU. And this has been integrated into their legislation and, actu and actually now they are expanding it across the whole region. So those are two examples, but as you could see, I mean, we wouldn't talk about integration in any of those. We could talk about some form of cooperation, which leads to some form of coordination between professionals and potentially sectors. But, you know, when we talk about actual integration, it's very, very difficult to see uh, anything across Europe. We've got some examples in Northern Ireland, which has been developing this for a number of years now, uh, since the 70s. And, and we've got the example of Scotland as well. There have been some pilots in England, but, but the truth is that, you know, large scale integration in this area where we work is very, very limited. And also the question is actually to see whether it is desirable is not 100% clear that it is. There are a number of examples that help, but not necessarily as a, as a whole uh, systems approach. Great, thanks so much, Alfonso, and also raising some provocative questions about when it makes sense and uh, uh, to try. And I see also in the chat some some examples popping up uh, from the social network in Portugal, and uh, and I know we have uh, on the call, you know, leaders of um, of organizations like Polball in uh, in Ireland that are really looking at how to support. Um, integrated services and in particular using um, also EU funds. So that's a great segue to you, uh, Iron Yota, who is a head of unit responsible for European social fund coordination. And uh, I know you've been around the commission. I've circled back now to the to the social fund. So you, as you heard uh, just a moment ago from that uh, unsolicited testimonial that the European social funds have actually been very helpful in trying to help link up and develop coordinated approaches that are hopefully achieving better results um, for people. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about how, from a European perspective, you're using um, the social fund to really help encourage these kinds of integration or coordination approaches um, that can also then be learned and scaled across uh, um, within countries and even uh, beyond countries. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and uh, happy to be here. And I have to admit, if there would be no examples, I think we would really be doing uh, something seriously wrong. <laughs> and so let, let uh, me start by also uh, uh, commenting a little bit on the presentation of Tilda, which I think presents it very nicely and 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 is really very interesting. And I I, I will sort of uh, I hope I can use it also to share it here in house. Uh, and but one thing I would add is is the relationship of trust between managers of different uh, services on local level and beyond. Uh, and they go all out and they take a risk by doing things differently from the past. And so you need all these managers aligned uh, in, in their willingness to take that risk. And that requires their managers also to, to in a way, pass the, the, the positive messages and to encourage this. And this alignment of faith, of trust in each other is uh, proving indeed to be uh, complicated from time to time. Um, but that is not what I wanted to say and what my colleagues asked me to say to you. So let me start with that and let me start to say a little bit uh, about the European Social Fund. And the social, uh, European Social Fund is really about investing in people in all the dimensions. So public employment services, link training, pathways into employment also for those further removed from the labor market, investing in curricula, uh, in the educational system, align it with labor market needs, whether that's private or public sector, uh, both, of course. Um, so we really have also, therefore, an, a, a really a big role to play 
in investing in affordable, accessible, and high quality uh, care services and and the integrated delivery uh, of those uh, dimensions. We finance things for seven year periods. We have programs for those that, that they'll know the fund so well over those seven years. And to give you an order of magnitude, the programs 2021, 2027, usually they have a sort of a run over of three years until 2030, have a combined value of 136 billion euro. Yeah. So Europe is really putting a lot of funding into this social dimension uh, of our policies into solidarity directly towards uh, citizens. And, and we learned a lot also, I think now in, in the COVID crisis and, and the, the, the impact uh, of, of the war in, in Ukraine in that I think also politically at the highest level, uh, a, a realization has come through that social services are really uh, uh, vital. It, it is more important than previously recognized, I would say, for social cohesion. And I think in the political context of things, this is this is very uh, important. It's not only that we are starting now, relatively starting a new programming period in a, in a, a context where there's general recognition, more support uh, to do the right thing, um, but also already now we're starting to look at the future the next period. And also in that context, it's very important that we build on achievements, but maybe also can be more ambitious. And, and I hope that that will materialize. It will be difficult, obviously. So what are we doing now? Well, we have created uh, relatively recently, we started uh, half a year ago with a social services uh, help desk. Uh, I, I came in this new position for me uh, I've been working on these matters uh, for a long time, but still uh, about six months ago. And one of the first contracts I had to sign was for this uh, help desk. And, and I think it's a great idea. So it's not only that we get our evidence, that's all very well, but it's especially to help social services and managing authorities to work together, to have uh, knowledge sharing activities, to facilitate access uh, to funding through providing information, often, you know, uh, uh, our partner social services, uh, NGOs in the field have limited capacity. They don't know where to turn to, and they can turn to this help desk to help them on the way, and, and also to help them in creating partnerships. And how do you do this? Partnerships with managing authorities and between managing authorities and various social services in a broad sense, social services. So it's really to reach the local level. Huh? And uh, well, so far so good. The first six months is of course a build up period, but uh, we, we see that uh, you know this investment is, is already creating a, a positive dynamic. So we are quite encouraged by this. Uh, and, and we would uh, encourage you also, if you're interested to visit uh, the webpage of the help desk and, and obviously we can share that. Then in terms of um, access to services, to give you a further idea on the money side. So that part of ESF financing represents uh, close to 17 billion euro over the next seven years. Again, that's specifically dedicated to improving access to services and modernizing social protection, healthcare systems, promoting access to social protection with a particular focus on children and disadvantaged groups. And, and so you see the, the, the funding dimension is quite strong. And then the last element I wanted to bring in is, is one, what we call a, um, a social innovation plus initiative. And what do we do there? Well, we partnered up with the ESF managing authority in Lithuania. We signed a 200 million contract uh, about four months ago, five months ago. Uh, and they try to take success cases and help to multiply this throughout Europe. So it is not only about financing pilot projects, but preferably pilot projects that where there's already a bit of experience and to boost the use of that, the information, the knowledge gathered in that context and spread it throughout Europe to finance projects of that nature throughout Europe 
to have this upscaling. I mean, social services, just like any other sector in the economy, needs to innovate as well. Uh, technology offers opportunities. Uh, and so this is really or also different methods. I mean, sometimes we, we have to look beyond the way we have been doing the last 15, 20 years things. And, you know, there are good ideas everywhere uh, in, in Romania, in, in, in Sweden, in Spain, and, and what have you. So the idea is really to spread the news, cooperate, and, and have an upscaling of successful cases. Often that works. Sometimes it doesn't. You have to accept this but really very much in the spirit of what you're discussing here today. I think that's a very quick overview. I can speak for two hours if you want, uh, but it's not the plan. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Daron. And, and, and also, I think, you know, a couple key words I want to flag that you mentioned. One is this trust element, which uh, I know I've seen in some of the comments and chats that the trust comes at different phases. And there's some question of, do you trust more when you're on the ground working versus when you're in a management higher up position thinking about who's getting the next proposal and who's competing for funding. So some of the, I think, um, incentives and frameworks that help us in, in promoting trust um, could, be, could be thought about. And then you also mentioned technology, which uh, I think is a very important point that as we do have different in opportunities through technology to help perhaps with some of these um, maybe more coordinated or integrated services, yet we also have other barriers with respect to um, knowledge and data sharing across uh, across administration. So what maybe what are opportunities that technology can bring to, to help us um, overcome that? Um, so maybe we'll get to some more questions then as well um, as we as we move on into the uh, into the the panel discussion. Um, I'm going to call now, Maybe to the virtual floor here, uh, Thomas Britton um, with Greater Manchester, because you oversee a working well program that has um, a history of really helping on employment services and, and health services. And I was wondering if you could, you know, just sort of kick off by telling us a little bit about how the Greater Manchester Combined Authority, you know, took this idea on board, um, kind of what did you do and how is it how is it working? And I, and I know that a lot of uh, the folks online and I see in one of the questions are also wondering if there's any evaluations um, done of the program that you wanted to share that can also help us in sort of getting that evidence base for why, uh, why this is worthwhile um, to overcome some of the barriers and hurdles that, that Tilda explained earlier. I think I might be competing for Jerome's uh, two hours here because there's a lot to a lot to fill, but you know what? We'll, we'll we'll hammer it into a, a smaller slot than that. First of all, thank you so much for the invite to come and talk uh, in this space. And uh, just the minds I imagine around the, around the table and, and and further into the room. You know the the experiences that we've all got extremely valuable in this space, and the opportunity is massive. Um, so I, I work for Greater Manchester Combined Authority, Greater Manchester in the United Kingdom, England. Um, and I manage a suite of programs slash on, on um, Alfonso's point, a system um, of integrated provision and otherwise it's called working well. When you break down working well, that's working, employment, well, health. That's the real focus, work and health. There was a report in the UK uh, by a lady called Dame Carol Black, and we helped to, it was called Improving Lives, and we helped her to develop that paper, but also continued um, with that paper as centre to, to our programme development, and that is that good work is good for your health and that vice versa, poor work is, is, is not good for your health and being out of work is terrible for your health and so on. Um, so working well, it's our whole population approach to health, skills and employment. And it recognizes that sort of triangulation and interlink between, between them all. Um, the program started in 2014 um, and really it was set out within a devolution context that said, um, Greater Manchester was unhappy with programmes being developed in London, dragged and dropped um, in Greater Manchester with little or no consideration of the local needs of local people, or indeed the infrastructural systems that already existed in Greater Manchester. 
And what we said to government is give us the money and we'll do better. Uh, brave move uh, for, 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 for you know, something we didn't really uh, know about, we wanted to learn about and otherwise. Uh, but we've spent the last how, uh, nine years now building a programme from a small pilot that tested sort of key principles that still reside within our, our, our programmes now. So to date, we've supported over 68,000 people. Um, 25,000 of them have moved into um, sustainable work, so longer term work. Um, and when we look at sort of direct delivery, so we've continued to a, a key worker model providing support um, to people through direct, directly commissioned providers through direct delivery. But then we've also, um, additional to that, utilise the system that we've got through our local authorities, through connections with the voluntary sector and through other de devolved powers to support um, clients. Um, just as an example, one programme has got 20, uh, 23,000 people on it and we've, we've offered um, 107 thousand interventions outside of the program across the health system across the skill system the housing system and so on um, it's actually um, five on average so don't do the maths don't rework that uh, but it's five on average um, and, uh, above and beyond interventions outside of our directly commissioned employment supports so that gives you an idea of the depth of support that's happening in the range of of support and otherwise so um our our, our programs kind of um, span quite a broad um sort of horizon or a broad spectrum let's say of, of individuals needs and with people on the program um, on our programs or specific programs for um economically um inactive um greater manchester residents long-term unemployed um, at risk of falling out of work so those who are in work with health conditions who might not get occupational health support and are at risk of falling out and those that are in work as well um in terms of i'm oh, sorry as in um you know they own a small business helping their businesses to succeed and, and otherwise and working with all sorts of different um, providers and otherwise to, to, to link the system together. So I, I mentioned earlier the key principles of the programmes um, that we run and that's about personalised support. How do we make sure through key worker provision that people get access to the right support at the right point in time and it's absolutely fundamental to what we do. So you know as I say key worker model critical to that that is an individual that sits down does action plans with, it, with, with our residents that are out of work, unpicks the key challenges and barriers, and then reroutes them into the right support at the right point in time. So if somebody presents with a drug and alcohol issue, who's moving into work, we like to unpick why have they got that issue, what sits underneath it, mental health problems or otherwise bereavements, where 26% of our, our cohort have been left bereft and have mental health conditions as a result of it. Um, so how do we how do we unpick the right spot right right point of time? Because there's no point getting somebody in work if they've got a drug and alcohol problem straight off the bat because they're going to fall out of work straight away. Let's unpick the sort of reasons as to why they're there and also their circumstances quite likely if you've got a drug and alcohol problem you've been out of work for a long period of time your housing situation is poor your skills that levels of may have disappeared over time um, you're at risk your family might be at risk your debt your finance and it spirals and goes on um, so on average uh, you know there are i think uh, six severe barriers to work for the individuals on our program. And that is, I couldn't get a job tomorrow because, so that's that sort of definition of, of severe. And there's only one way of getting the right support at the right point in time, and that is through local integration. How do we do that in Greater Manchester? So Greater Manchester is made up of 10 local authorities, sort of 10 district areas across a city conurbation. Um, and, and we coordinate that with the local authorities, setting out clear, um, local integration plans, um, clear asks of, of, of providers that are coming in and otherwise about working together and how we support that co-location, co-production and, 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 and so on. Um, and then we have regular integration meetings uh, to, to stay on, on top of that. But also, you know, and I, I will, um, I, I don't know how I'm doing for time. Um, but, um, you know, I think absolutely key to it is about that sort of system that I spoke about, uh, where the fundamental principles of how you orchestrate, just not, not just support around people, 
but the broader how do you orchestrate a system of health work and skills and doing that through strategic alignment setting clear goals and uh, and you know strategic goals around what we are here to achieve about how we co-produce our projects and programs together about how we share accountability in delivering them so it's you know it's coming from a high to say this is our key goals and strategy and vision but it's your responsibility to deliver this part of it and component parts that helps us to overcome some of the cultural barriers that, uh, that have been met and then shared governance as part of that accountability as well um underpinning so final words because i know i've taken a fair bit of time but um, final words on on it really is in in 10 years of work Working across this space for, for 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 me there's sort of one's been mentioned already um, and, and that is trust trust is so important whether it's between organizations or whether it be between a key worker and the individual who's seeking support trust is essential but the underpin the one thing that the integration boils down to no matter which way you look at it is about relationships and relationships are interpersonal they're between people and they're very difficult to measure. They're very difficult to manage. People come and go, people change and, and otherwise, and relationships get established and get lost. Um, and that for me is one of the key challenges as well around integration. Thank you so much, Thomas. And I think maybe in the panel discussion, if we can get into a little bit more on some of these issues of uh, relationships, trust and uh, incentives, because some of these uh, incentives frame a bit uh, the uh, actions for um, for those relationships, especially on the ground. And great, maybe in the panel, if you can also share a little bit with us um, when Manchester did this, did they pool pots of money? Did they um, did they uh, allocate new funds, uh, th things like that? So keep that in mind for, for the panel, because I think everyone would really love to know, uh, especially having been doing this for a few years, the different lessons that you've learned on that front. Um, so we're now going to do a little um, fly over to Lyon. Um, and we have Aurélie Robin, who is joining us. Um, um, from uh, the city of Lyon, and um, let's see, there we go, Aurélie, and uh, you know, you're the head of the France Travail Project uh, in the Lyon metropolitan region, and so if you really could help us uh, understand a little bit um, what is it that you're working on, because I know this is also, there's also some uh, reforms in the air, if you will, within within France in general, and I know you've been doing some, uh, some piloting, um, especially with those furthest from the labor market, so um, help us understand a little bit about kind of the activities that you're taking and what you're learning in Lyon. Yeah, uh, thank you for inviting me. Good afternoon, everyone. Everyone, um, the French tra Travail uh, project intends to reform the employment service in every scale. Uh, of course, uh, it concerns uh, the employment policies, but also the social and integration policies uh, as, part, as part of uh, unemployed people are vulnerable and far from finding work. Um, this project was launched last September by the French government with conciliation meetings with all the stakeholders during several months. Uh, they dealt with issues linked to employment policies, training, inclusion, integration, and globally all things that could prevent job seekers to find work. Uh, so now a draft bill uh, will be proposed to the French parliament in July with two objectives, the creation of a community and governance for the employment and linked uh, policies called France Travail, and secondly, the transformation of the main French employment agency, uh, it is Pôle emploi, into an operator also named uh, France Travail. It will act as uh, the executive coordinator of this public policy for job seekers. Uh, the governance to come is composed uh, by steering committees, also named France Travail committees, on each, each uh, administrative scales, local, like metropole, uh, regional, and national levels. Uh, the principal issue is to better coordin coordinate uh, public policies. Uh, to this end, uh, all the stakeholders have to work together in a better way, and so all the committees are chaired by both state and local authorities' representatives. In order to share the same information on, in, on all levels, a unique and shared dashboard will be created. All competent authorities and institutions will be required to share the necessary data to provide the, the unique dashboard. 
Uh, the draft bill also proposes uh, that the French travail uh, operator has a leading role into the ecosystems animation, the support for companies' recruitments, and the tracking of all the job seekers, whatever status they have. Uh, so the, the implementation conditions of the draft bill are yet not be not to uh, be specified. So uh, a huge part of the forthcoming reform concerns the French minimum allowance uh, called Revenu de Solidarité Active or RSA, uh, received by the unemployed people with no income, mostly the furthest, the furthest from job or unable to work. Uh, the, French com the French government has launched an experiment on several territories to prepare a reform of the RSA law. 17 departments and Lyon Metropole have been chosen to experiment new services for the beneficiaries of the RSA. The government, uh, the government promotes a job for everyone, even for deprived people, aside from social issues for these people. Uh, the, um, the most debated point of the experiment is the mandatory amount of time dedicated to inclusion actions. Uh, this can include medical appointments, uh, language training, activities in community center, etc. Um, here in Metropole, the president of Lyon Metropole is not on the same line as the national guidance. He wants to promote the right to integration, professional or social, if needed, and absolutely no monetary activities. Besides, on the metropolitan territory, there is a Maison de l'Emploi, the MME, already in charge of the local coordination of integration, professionals, and of supporting the companies willing to invest in inclusion. The execution of the project uh, involves working on the link between different public policies for the most vulnerable. Uh, for example, uh, as a person starts to receive the RSA, she is invited to come and see professionals of different inst institutions in the same place. It helps her to know her rights and to have access to medical care or to obtain a public transportation card uh, only in the, in the same place. The principal issue is to gather institutions physically in the same place in a third place logic or more, more practical with a common service offering. Uh, another specificity of our project uh, is the choice of a wide governance. Lyon, Lyon Metropole will associate social housing landlords, association with working on with deprived people, civic participation, as well as integration stakeholders and companies. So, um, so, so this work is new because uh, we have worked on the experiment for only six months, but uh, the main lessons are linked to, um, the main lessons uh, I've, uh, I've learned from this work see, um, are linked to cooperation and the difficulties you have to conceive common processes and projects. The experiment is managed both by Pôle emploi, the employment agency, a future operator of France Travail, and Lyon Metropole, a change practicing way of supporting job seekers. And it is a long term work, even if the professionals agree uh, the objective. Besides, uh, building a common strategy involves a change in the strategic position of each stakeholder. And it is a very long term work, too. Thank you. Merci, Aurélie. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for helping give us a preview also of uh, um, a reform that's coming down the pike, but also some of the things that you're finding as you help uh, in the piloting of these reforms. And I, I really pick up this, uh, that everyone needs to change a little bit their strategy in order for this to work, which I think is, um, is really interesting. And it ties up um, also with a question we have in the question and answer uh, function that's um, in Polish, but uh, translates into a um, you know, question about whether you need to be fully integrated or if in some cases just good collaboration with clear objectives and division of roles, if that's 
if that sort of does the job. So I think it'll be interesting also to pick that up in the, the panel um, discussion. So um, we're going to go to our last uh, presentation um, and we're going to fly now over to Brussels. I guess we can take the train from Lyon to Brussels. Um, and uh, we yes, have we this, can. <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> for ecological reasons as well. Um, you, um, you know, Rogier and Alice Baltus. Um, um, both Hello, everyone. Yeah, welcome, welcome, Yuna and Alice. So you're uh, respectively head and deputy head of local coordination of Actoris in Brussels, Belgium, um, and really looking forward to hearing about uh, some of the work that you're doing um, with respect to uh, bringing together locally through the Maison de l'Emploi um, integrated services uh, for people um, through uh, the Brussels capital region. So I'll, I'll hand over the floor to you, Yuna and Alice. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting us today. So um, as just introduced, uh, we work for the Regional Employment Office uh, of Brussels in Belgium called Actiris. Uh, it is the most important provider of employment solution to both job seekers and employers in the capital. Um, to give you a better insight on the specificity of the Brussels job market, uh, the unemployment rate is 15% uh, on average over 2022. So in order to tackle these challenges, uh, Actiris is working with a network of partners and each partner has its own objective and targeted beneficiaries. In the past few years, uh, there has been a strong trend toward more and more decentralization of services closest to the job seekers themselves. And our service is called uh, the Local Coordination Service and it was created in 2012 as a way to bring together this uh, variety of partners in the job market and to create synergies of action and a more inclusive uh, job market. Our mission is to act as a bridge between partners acting at the local level and the regional office so that the Brussels job market can be easier, a bit easier to navigate for the job seekers themselves. Um, to do so in practice, we uh, created uh, you create <laughs> the concept of Maison de l'Emploi. Um, so Maison de l'Emploi are de facto associations, so they don't have any uh, legal structure. Um, and it is a local one-stop shop integrating a variety of first-line services for job seekers. Um, so they are distributed by municipality uh, across the Brussels region, and there are 17 of them. They differ in terms of uh, partner composition, size, according to the local context and history of collaborations. Uh, some of them are physical grouping of local partners, so in the same building, and other one a purely virtual one, and other are also hybrid uh, model. Um, so we talked a bit earlier about building trust um, to do so. Uh, there are different uh, local coordinators from activists that are assigned by municipality uh, to facilitate the links between the different members, to coordinate regular steering committees between the partners, to coordinate also uh, the building of mutual action plan and so on. Um, they are considered as the ambassadors of the region, but also of the partners themselves. Uh, so they are really this interface between uh, the regional and the local level. They also support the different partners in carrying out joint projects that are financed uh, by activists uh, on a yearly basis. Uh, and they are financed on the, and they are constructed on the basis of joint needs assessments. What are the benefits of such approach? Uh, for the job seekers themselves, first, uh, it facilitates access to appropriate services and information at the right time in one place and closer to where they live. Um, it is really important knowing that uh, mobility can be a challenge in Brussels and in particular for uh, vulnerable groups. Um, in Brussels, we have 19 municipalities and they are also very different in socioeconomic terms. So by having this uh, different maison de l'emploi uh, locally, it allows us to have this local intelligence on issues that are not well addressed and gaps. So this proximity 
also give us um, a way to respond more quickly to contextual changes. For example, it was the case during the, the COVID crisis. Um, and it allows us to be more agile than a highly centralized player uh, in the employment sector. Um, it's also an opportunity, we talked about it earlier uh, in the paper, it's also an opportunity to test new methodologies and to innovate at local level before taking project to the regional level um, with a broader funding, for instance. For the partners themselves, uh, we create these uh, synergies of action. Um, we support them in doing so, and it facilitates adequate referrals of job seekers between them. Um, and it helps also uh, strengthening the labor market governance overall. Um, really practically, practically uh, it can also reduce fixed costs by pulling some of the service, services of the partners together. Uh, for instance, reception, meeting rooms, training rooms, and so on. Um, what are the challenges that we face? Uh, we identified three of them. Uh, first of all, uh, the both source institutional complexity. So we need to keep a constant watch on our partners, new one, uh, to navigate this complex system uh, for the benefit of the job seekers themselves. That's what we are doing with our service. Um, another challenge is related to culture and political alignment. We also uh, touched briefly on this earlier, but it can be challenging to bring together this uh, diversified network of actors with different organizational culture, corporate culture. Some of them are politically related, local authorities, other are private actors. So, um, uh, and the third challenge, is, challenge as a regional actor is to find this right balance between the harmonization of initiative, so for more coherence, and the celebration of local differences and specificities. So we are really always uh, trying to find this, uh, this right balance. Um, and if you want more information, do not hesitate to ask questions uh, in the chat. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Yuna and Alice. And uh, I know that uh, you're operating in a complex institutional environment, uh, and we're happy at the OECD to actually be working on a, a study uh, looking at uh, Brussels, a city of talent, looking at um, uh, some of the opportunities that you have there. And, and I think uh, you mentioned a lot of really interesting issues associated with local intelligence and very different situations in different communities that um, that these local maisons de l'emploi are able to then highlight uh, with different socioeconomic groups, different professional uh, backgrounds and, and things like that. Um, maybe just to have everyone back on the virtual stage in the last few minutes here, because uh, we have um, a few questions that I think uh, a lot of you um, would be very helpful in, in answering. And so, I, I mean, there's a the sort of question about integration versus coordination. So we've had a couple of questions on that front. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to pop in on their thoughts on that. And, and I don't know if, uh, if Thomas, you know, if you would consider yours more integrated than some of the other models you heard about, or if it's more coordination and, and for others to sort of jump in on this, you know, integration versus coordination uh, question, which I think uh, a lot of people are interested in hearing about. Karima, I, I wouldn't dare make that statement, you know, not with, not, not with a short 10 minute overview of, uh, of everybody's areas, but, I, you know, I, I'm confident that we've got um, a well integrated system here, here, here in GM. Um, I would say coordination is part of, 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 of integration. It's, you know, you can't have integration without coordination. It's a big part of the relationship development, it's a big part of the strategy development, big part of the co-production and whatever. So it's, it's fundamental. But I suppose, um, I suppose um, what, what, what we might be saying is, do you need to have all this structure in place to deliver good relationships on the ground. And I think that's where that question might be coming from. And I would say it depends on the size and scale of what you're trying to deliver. Um, I think delivering integration or a coordinated approach to providing support on a project um, where you know it's it's a more of a controllable environment, then the answer to that is no. As soon as you start going into that larger space and Alfonso's point about system integration, then you start to need structure and framework and agreements and service, you know, service level agreements to kind of policy 
practice and, and otherwise. So I, I would say yeah, you're all right with coordination for a little while, um, but you can't coordinate data sharing in that way. You need structures. There's the legal sides of it when you're looking at pooling budgets and otherwise. And Karen, I know you mentioned pooling budgets, such an important part of, you know, for us, the next phase of devolution and integra further integration is about how we chuck all our monies into one pot and make the right decisions and sparing perhaps outside noise from um from from, from central government or or, or or other actors so i think it's um again a really important point that structure um depends on size right and then i know we have some time constraints but if um uh, Jeroen or Alfonso had any comments they wanted to come in on in general, given the discussion uh, before they have to leave, if you had any any other um, sort of final reflections or thoughts based on what you've been hearing today. Uh, very briefly, I would say, well, I agree with uh, Thomas comment, uh, you cannot have integration without having coordination in the first place, I see more cooperation and coordination as more day to day and you could have, for example, professionals working together, cooperating with each other or also uh, coordinated service delivery and, provi and coordinated provision, even you could also have an integrated approach uh, to service delivery, but uh, if we talk about integration as integrated system, I honestly think that there are very few integrated systems in Europe. Uh, honestly, like really, we've looked a lot. And uh, and when you look at integration, you really have to have in place a proper structure. You have to have, I, I think, in addition to the question of having a joint budget, pool budgets, uh, uh, management teams, you have to actually be ready, be mature enough. So the sectors have to be mature enough to be able to speak to each other at the same level. And this is not that easy because um, usually what happens in the sector in which we work is that social services are in many cases actually underfunded. They are not necessarily at the same level that employment might be, the health is. So they're usually the uh, poorer cousin of, you know, as they say in the UK, of the NHS, for instance. And indeed, we see that, and that complicates the question of integrating. Again, whether is integration the right answer is also another, another question as well to look at. So um, I think that these are my general, uh, my general uh, uh, considerations and my general feedback there. But I do think that there are very good examples of coordinated approaches to service provision across a number of countries, also about uh, co coordinated ways in which services are being contracted out, in which, you know, public authorities are working with service providers, you know, as I said, not necessarily seeing them as contractors, but more seeing them as partners, changing also some of the ways in which public procurement coming from the EU is not necessarily the best way in which services, particularly social services, can be provided locally. So I think we need to look at the wider picture and not just focusing on the term integration and integration as the panacea, but more looking at the uh, final objective and seeing what's best uh, to make sure that the objectives can be delivered. And it will change from place to place. Um, and it will change also from organization to organization. And of course, you need to look at the type of persons that those uh, services are trying to support as well. What are their needs? Uh, what are their requirements and adapt your services accordingly. Thank you so much, Alfonso. Um, and then I know, uh, uh, Jeroen, you need to, yeah, no, to leave okay. uh, in a couple seconds here. So, no, I, I, I first of all, on, on integration and versus coordination, I think Thomas put it very nicely, and I can really not improve on that. But, um, you know, what we try to do on the European level is one to, to put in place the structures. Uh, so that people can find information, can find good practices, can get there the experience. Also, as 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 Thomas explained a bit, to move, you know, it's all very well to have a good cooperation on a local level, but how do you create this on a on a bigger scale? And what are the service agreements that uh, lie behind that in order to make it a bigger success, a wider success? And so I, I think we try to put in place you know the the examples uh, the contact details uh, i think you know what i see is that people are very outgoing in sharing this information we're doing a lot of outreach activities a lot of 
communities of uh, practice uh, activities to promote this actively uh, uh, throughout the managing authorities. They have a specific uh, priority in all their programs, each member, member state on social innovation in which these kind of things can push forward, be pushed forward. So I, I, I think, you know, there's a there's a, a sort of a framework there. It's not perfect, but it certainly provides a lot of tools and 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 elements to build on. And then I, I would say, last but not least, that then luck favors the bold. You know, there needs to be a sense of initiative, like an entrepreneurial initiative, mm -hmm. for individuals, a group of individuals, to move forward on that in in their town, in their community. Uh, and and be brave and this is difficult but you see it happening throughout Europe uh, with extremely positive results uh, I was last week in Sweden where we visited two projects of this nature uh, you know one with people further removed from the labor market with mental problems and they can be brought back in and and you know that it is possible and even with very positive results both for the individuals but also for the businesses uh, that hire them or for the public services uh, and so you know I, I, I think there uh, there's a lot of good out there and, and possibility for progress and I, I'm rather optimistic I have to say. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I know I know you might have to uh, log out before we uh, before we wrap up. Um, thank you again for taking the time to be with us here today. Um, Aurélie, Yuna, Alice, um, you've heard a little bit of some of the, you know, some of these different discussions. Um, so from the Brussels capital region and the experiences with the uh, Maison de l'Emploi, what is sort of the next is there any sort of next thinking or where do you see you need to take this after, you know, having set up this infrastructure of these entities that are um, trying to bring this local coordination? Um, what do you see as sort of the, the next, uh, the next uh, goals that you have? Uh, now it's to have a, a, be a better ecosystem, a larger, more larger. So not only the, the, the first stakeholders, but to see now further uh, for uh, other stakeholders to work with us and to uh, make more um, co-construction and mm -hmm. so on. Okay, great. So bringing more people under the umbrella of the Maison de l'Emploi and uh, that everyone yeah. sort of is aware of what are the resources and how to make it work. Um, and Aurélie, you're, uh, you're in the midst of testing uh, for a reform that's going to go nationwide. Uh, so I know that uh, you've had some of these experiences and in, in testing, are there, um, are there any other sort of lessons you want to share on this effort to bring together um, sort of national um, offices of uh, the employment service with uh, the Lyon city and where it will be like, uh, you know, around, of course, uh, other parts of France. Anything else you want to add on this um, experiment that you've helped with um, in Lyon? Um, I'm not sure. Is it just me that's having trouble hearing? I can't hear either. Okay. Aurélie, on vous entend pas, en fait. Je ne sais pas si y a un souci de micro. Is that simul? Ah, that works. Ah, that works. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the next, uh, now, yes, we are experimenting. It's very new. But um, the most important thing, I think, to create cooperation, it's to create a common culture uh, with the professionals mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, on a level and with the institutions in another level. For the professional, we are working on a schedule of, um, of, of shared cultures for professionals. Um, our objective is to gather uh, the professionals who coach uh, job seekers from social, social service associations and um, job centers together one day each month. Uh, they will have e-learning classes on new tools, exchanges, exchanges, sorry, on practical situation and, and information about service offerings. Uh, it's important to create culture, trust, uh, to cooperate. Great. Well, I think that's one of the one of the clear common themes that we've heard trust uh, 
amongst the different uh, public authorities, maybe the social economy or non nonprofits that are also supporting, um, but also trust between the officials that are helping and the, the people that are that the, that they're serving. Um, so I think we've come actually to the end of our hour and 15. Uh, I'm, I wish we could go much longer, but I know uh, people have been really busy schedules. So um, I think this is a conversation to be continued because I know there were lots of other interesting questions as well in the chat on different ways of financing this sort of integration coordination. What are the, the sort of sparks for this entrepreneurial spirit locally to make it happen? How to better use different existing systems? I saw there was a little debate there on the chat about also procurement um, and, and some of the other ways that uh, that we um, that we try to make integration happen. Um, so again, I think um, we'll have to continue this conversation with some other um, webinars and activities through um, the, our local development forum and then through your other different uh, venues. So um, a huge thanks to all of our speakers uh, for coming from, you know, the European perspective all the way down to um, the sort of uh, city perspective. So really appreciate uh, all of your time today um, and look forward to um, future webinars. So just so everyone knows, if you're interested in learning about how you can get the most out of global events for local development, like if you're hosting an Olympics, for example, or something, don't, don't hesitate to join us uh, on July 6th. Um, and then I think in the month of September, where we have uh, a number of webinars coming up also on the social economy, which um, tends to be also a very important actor in helping to provide uh, tailored integrated services, um, both directly and as a, as a supplier for some of the entities that, that many of you work for. So again, thank you so much and have a wonderful afternoon to all of our panelists and our uh, participants in the webinar.